Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Director's Forum. We are delighted to have you all here. And um, today's guest is Kevin Davis, who uh, heads the Investigative News Network. This is something very dear to my heart, um, as with many of you in this room, investigative reporting uh, is something I care a great deal about. And uh, I've long been on the board of the Center for Public Integrity, which is a nonprofit investigative reporting organization in DC. Um, and of course, all of us who care about investigative reporting are worried over recent years that of all the kinds of reporting that are very much affected by the collapse of the economic model for legacy media, this one is among the most disturbing prospects. What are we going to do if we don't have watchdog reporting? You know, there are a lot of sexier kinds of reporting to some people that may more readily attract financial support, but what about this kind of fundamental of, of uh, of our democracy. So last summer, not this just past summer, but a year ago, um, a group of people got together in Pocantico in New York and um, thought about this and worried about this. And the Nightingale Foundation had been worrying about it as well. And the good news is that at 42, now 42 organizations are part of the Investigative News Network. Some of them are state. Um, you know, like there's a Maine Center for Investigative Reporting and an Iowa Center for Investigative Reporting. And some of them are city um, organizations and, and, you know, the Men Post and the Twin Cities and St. Louis Beacon, et cetera, et cetera. And some of them uh, are associated with journalism schools and some of them are in other forms. And so we'll hear about that from the first CEO of the Investigative News Network who lives here in Los Angeles. Kevin Davis, and I want to say that on this very first day of her job, our own catering lady sports owner, who's here getting her master's in specialized journalism, last year is the new director of communications right, for INN. So welcome both of you and Kevin, it's all yours. Thank you. First of all, very, very happy to be here. Um, this is actually my first official public speaking engagement as, uh, as the new CEO of INN, so uh, this, is, this is great. Um, you know, what I want to do today is tell a little bit about myself, tell you a little bit more about what we're doing and actually get more engagement with you and actually see if we can actually have a good discussion about uh, the state of investigative journalism and, and what you define as investigative journalism and why we think it's important. So um, a little bit more about myself. Uh, I am not a native of the States, I, uh, as you might have <laughs> gathered. Um, however, I have been in Los Angeles since 1978, which definitely uh, is, is a while. Um, my career sort of took a very interesting route, but I ended up doing a lot of work in, you know, a surprise in the entertainment business, and uh, found myself working very early on in, in the web space, starting in 1994. Um, did, I wrote a very bad TV show that was called Microsoft, wrote a web, uh, did a website for them, but then got involved in, in entertainment news, and I discovered two things. Uh, one is that uh, the news business, particularly entertainment news, is actually a, a potential place for innovation in, in defining the way people consume news in digital media and, and across multimedia. And that second of all, most people involved in that business actually didn't get it. Uh, and that they weren't themselves looking at any other than protecting existing revenue streams. So um, I became uh, a sort of self-defined uh, uh, disintermediator. So I would focus a lot on helping companies rethink their business models and working with, with all sorts of media companies. Uh, in my day, I worked with studios. Uh, I also worked with uh, newspapers, LA Times. I was also the former uh, head of uh, Digital for Variety for a period of time, which is a, 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 an entertainment news magazine. Uh, most recently, I was the COO of an upstart website, news entertainment news website called therap.com, which is focused on business entertainment. Before that, I also was uh, the present of Hollywood.com, which is yet another celebrity site. So, a couple of things. I realized that, uh, as I said, entertainment news has the potential of, of reaching a lot of people. What was interesting about that was that it was widely popular with the, the, the masses, but it was also highly commoditized. And the relationship between the content and the end user or reader, depending which way you look at the individuals, uh, was extremely one way, and, and uh, there, while there was opportunity for community, there wasn't a lot of that being uh, exploited. So, um, a fantastic opportunity uh, called, and, and uh, I, I was recruited to to, uh, to this new organization, the Investigative News Network. So, 
What I find incredibly interesting about what we do at INN, and I can tell you what INN is in a second, is that our focus here is to, and there's a, this is the Contico Declaration, which you guys can take a look at uh, later on, but I, I want to point you to this. So this was the, the, the conference that Geneva talked about, and this was a declaration that was made from which INM was formed. But what was, was so amazing to me about this is this organization is designed to aid and abet in every conceivable way the propagation of non-profit newsrooms for investigative and public interest journalism. Okay? So the interesting thing is, what is INN? INN is, is, is a unique organization. It is an umbrella organization. We are a, uh, a non-profit. Our 501c3 is in process right now. But we are an umbrella organization for these 42 soon to be larger uh, other nonprofit organizations that put out investigative and public interest journalism. So our role, and my role as a result, it falls into five buckets. Uh, the first bucket is, um, and I'll cut to the chase in this one, everyone is interested in sustainability. Okay? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in greater depth. But sustainability, in my mind, sounds like revenue streams. But it isn't just revenue streams, of course. It's operational efficiency, uh, and it's a contract between people who have money and is w are willing to spend money and content. And those folks could be end users or readers, but they could also be for-profit news organizations. Um, by the way, if anybody would like to interrupt me at any time to ask questions, I'm totally all right with that. Don't, don't wait to the end. It's fine. Um, other things we do. So we talked about sustainability. Uh, we also, um, because we are 42 strong and we have members of different shapes and sizes, we're also focused on editorial collaboration to, to allow content to find the either widest audience possible or at least to have the highest impact possible with a target audience. In not all cases do, does every story have to have the widest audience possible. So editorial collaboration uh, here's, here's a great uh, example. Uh, before I joined, there was a story uh, that I heard driving down the street uh, on NPR called Campus Assault. It's actually a three-day uh, piece. Turned out that was actually uh, the first collaborative effort through INN. It was led by Center for Public Integrity, involved four other members. And uh, you know, I probably can't do the story justice by, by paraphrasing, but essentially it was looking at how, frankly, universities were sweeping under the rug systemic uh, use of, of, uh, of drugs to, uh, for, for raping and, and all sorts of horrible things, and why people were not being prosecuted uh, accordingly. Um, and what I found interesting about that, besides that I found the story incredibly compelling and, and somewhat eye-opening for me, having not been in college for a couple of years, um, is that uh, the story was the thing, right? In other words, what, what, even though, yes, this was a collaborated by multiple efforts and, and, and lots of different folks were involved, the story was the thing. It was extremely compelling. I tuned back in. I actually wasn't in the car one day, so I found it on, online. And it, it was really a very, very a moving story. And it had the first one had for me. Turns out, as I said later on, I found out that that was part of the network and was a big emotional factor in why I thought this job was going to be the greatest thing for all time. So. so we talked a little bit about sustainability. We talked a little bit about uh, editorial. Three other functions that INN is, is here to do for our members. Uh, one is uh, technology. Uh, and technology, not for technology itself, say, but the idea being, how do we use systems, systems that we obviously involve people as well as technology, to have that content be better uh, and more easily and efficiently produced and disseminated and tracked, right? So what's interesting is, when I was in my for-profit days, when I was running Variety.com or Hollywood.com, we would measure a success, besides in revenue, by audience size, right? And eventually, audience size equated to page views, and page views equated to ad, in, ad inventory, and ad inventory equated to profit. So that equation, in a non-profit new sense, has changed, or is changing. Now, I will tell you that we do have members who do have advertising on the side. But when you talk to most of the people who are involved editorially on, on, on non-profit investigative news, the, the measurement of success, and it's interesting to come up with, it, with metrics around this, is impact, right? What impact from the stories? It can be an emotional impact. It can be engagement on the social graph. 
It can be, of course, when we're trying to keep people and authorities uh, and corporations uh, in power accountable, it could actually affect change um, at the local, national, or international level. And I think that, for me, is a, is, a, is a very, very important factor. So when I look at things like editorial collaboration, and I look at things like the technology systems that we want to help put in place, ultimately, the measurement is not in the efficiency of the technology or the editorial collaboration, but again, in the impact. So to, the, to that end, um, another function is going to be for us marketing and PR, right? So without sounding terribly naive or, 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 or too, uh, well, whatever. Uh, I believe very strongly that without keeping people accountable, without investigative journalism in the public interest, we cannot have a free society as we cherish. And that's not just true for America, that's true globally. So, so you know, this is a, a higher cause, and, 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 and accountability is a big part of that. So while that is a very, very important factor, I also believe that the vast majority of consumers, users, readers, however you want to call them, audience members, um, that, that, is, that, that is not really an important factor in their day-to-day -day lives. In fact, um, there's clear evidence that's, that shows that people feel like they're getting more news than ever, and yet their understanding of the benefits of nonpartisan investigative journalism uh, and their appreciation of that has decreased. So, I'm in a bit of a dilemma here, right? So on one hand, I see our organization as being on the cutting edge of defining new forms of journalism and understanding where things are heading. On the other hand, I also need to activate an audience and reach a public that uh, is disaffected uh, and has a lack of appreciation for what we do. L let, me, let me do this. Just, just I'm going to poll the audience a little bit here, okay? I'm seeing different generations in the room, uh, different, different backgrounds. Um, for those of you under the age of 40, for a second, okay? Um, just shout out, uh, what would you consider to be a, a good example recently of investigative journalism that affected you? City of Bell. Sorry? City of Bell. City of Bell. Uh, can you tell me more about how you discovered that story? Okay. Website or paper? Uh, website. Okay. Um, how is that investigative journalism? Uh, they researched, they, you know, they got the public information requests for the documents, you know, nailed down the interviews with the city manager, and, uh, you know, kind of revealed this, this fact that nobody knew, and if they, you know, and, and afterwards, after we find out, you know, we're outraged and, and motivated to do something. I think it's a great example. And, and, and frankly, I think that it, it actually reflects, uh, Cater and I were talking about this earlier, LA Times' renewed effort to actually bring more investigative journalism to, uh, to our, our, our area. Anybody else? Any other examples? And, and think a little bit more expansively also. I mean, we could talk about, yes, go ahead. Uh, top Secret America. Okay. Washington Post. Washington Post. Um, I have good friends who are living there in the summer, and they forwarded it on to me. It was amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> and, and, and how did you experience it? So you, somebody turned you on to it. Did you, was that an email or you found it in the social graph? Or, and then what, and how did you actually experience the content? Um, someone sent it to me in a link, so I read it online. Um, and I went through most of it on there, like little, you could click through the stories one right. by one. And then I did a little bit of the interactive, but mostly I just stayed with the, just read the stories. And, I know, I passed it on to a bunch of other people too. Fantastic. These, yeah. these are good examples. Both cases, interestingly, both traditional newspapers and experiencing the content online. Anybody else? Let me throw out a couple. Uh, the Cove. Investigative journalism, yes or no? Anybody see the Cove? Anybody know what the Cove is? Yes. Okay. Is it investigative journalism? Yes, of course. Absolutely. WikiLeaks. Yeah. It is investigative journalism? Winter story. <laughs> well, I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, methodology in the content out here. Let, let me, I'll back up a little bit now. I'm going to come back to WikiLeaks. So, um, to become a member of INN, there are three criteria for evaluation. The first is uh, you have to be a nonprofit. So, by definition, that means you either have to be a 501c3 
be in process as we are, or you have to have a fiscal agent that is uh, I1C3. In, in, in INN's case, the Center for Public Integrity is our public agent while our, our application is in process. Uh, the second thing is that you have to be involved in investigative journalism and or public interest journalism. Uh, definitions are obviously uh, interesting around that. So for example, in some cases, like the St. Louis Beacon, which is one of our members, which is this site here, does not just do investigative journalism. They actually are, for all intents and purposes, a newspaper replacement product online. They are a nonprofit. Uh, great site, by the way. Uh, please check that out. Um, uh, the editor of this actually sits on our board. So uh, they have to be involved in investigative journalism and public interest journalism. Um, for many folks, that also includes uh, computer-assisted reporting and, and uh, deep dives into that. Um, did anybody? Uh, Notice the LA Unified uh, story on LA Times about how the things are up in arms and they basically took a, a database and they told stories out of that piece, which I think is an interesting product too. Also, LA Times recently did a murder map uh, of Los Angeles, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, so the third thing, that, which is I think also very challenging for myself and for, my, uh, for the organization, is to become a member and to remain a member, one has to be involved in nonpartisan journalism. So the way we aim to keep on that very narrow path is uh, to make sure that our members have transparency in funding, right? So if you don't disclose who your major donors are, there's probably something to hide. We don't want to become uh, overt tools of either uh, wing of, uh, of, the, of the political spectrum. So those are the three criteria for evaluation for, for INN. So I'll go back to WikiLeaks, for example, which I find WikiLeaks to be quite compelling. I, um, there's a couple of issues, obviously, around that. But one thing uh, Julian Assange won't do is he won't disclose his funders. So at this time, WikiLeaks, if, should they want to be a member, could not be a member until such time as they do. But I think it, it, it's an interesting innovation in, in, in investigative journalism. So I've talked about going back to my mandate. We talked about revenue generation, we talked about technology, we talked about editorial collaboration, PR marketing. The last thing that we do, which is a little less sexy, but extremely important to our members, is back office functions. So I'm trying to leverage the, the breadth of the network to uh, get folks affordable media insurance, uh, working with pro bono legal networks to get pre-publication review. Um, some of these are fundamentally important factors. Now, what's interesting is, what well, is to me, uh, a good majority of my members right now have previously come out of newsrooms, and the vast majority of those newsrooms were print-centric. So uh, these are folks who are used to having legal teams, access to LexisNexis, uh, you know, uh, unlimited re resources when it comes to photography and graphics, and now all of a sudden these centers are finding themselves to be completely on their own. The way I characterize it is like doing trapeze without a net which is all well and good, but what tends to happen when you do investigative journalism is you upset some people, right, in the inherent nature, and they tend to lawyer up pretty quickly and then there's an interesting conversation there. So when I go back to sustainability as a conversation, the back office function will also feed sustainability because without legal review, without pro bono legal help, frankly, uh, a lot of these newsrooms could not continue to exist. And I believe in CPI's history, there was a, an interesting scenario where there was a very, very uh, aggressive uh, legal situation of which CPI prevailed in, but was, was very, very difficult. Um, so let's talk a little bit about my different kind of members. Any questions, comments, concerns? Am I on target here? Good. Thanks for that. Um, there are sort of four types of members. Um, and I say sort of, and I'm, I'm ambiguous around that because, frankly, I find very little commonality my membership, other than the fact that these people produce phenomenally good investigative journalism for the most part. Um, up at the biggest level, we have National Public Radio. Uh, National Public Radio is a member. Um, I think they're somewhat atypical because obviously they're bigger than just investigative journalism, but more importantly, they, they, they just earn another level. Um, their interest obviously is in investigative journalism and they are a phenomenal partner for which we get our content distributed. And as you know, National Public Radio isn't is actually rebranded itself as NPR, and they do no, they no longer want to refer to the National Public Radio in public anymore, because they, they understand more and more that they are becoming much bigger than just their, their, their radio efforts. We also have um, large national um, centers. The two uh, that come to mind uh, would be Center for Public Integrity and Center for Investigative Reporting. Uh, Center for Investigative Reporting is in Berkeley. Um, 
and uh, CPI is in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, CPI is very much national stories. Uh, we also have uh, folks like the Pulitzer Center, which are focusing on more international stories. But these are more global impact, large type projects. Um, a number of, a, a couple of our uh, members are also funds, and they actually fund some of the content. So there's a, there's a tremendous community there. But another part of it, which I think is, uh, I find very interesting, are regional centers and, and uh, local centers. So, um, you know, we have folks like the Lens in New Orleans, uh, four or five people down in New Orleans uh, doing investigative journalism. Where is the Lens? As you can see, our, our alphabetizing is not great. Um, so here, and this, I, I find this to be extremely compelling because what we're talking about here is taking these sort of, um, frankly, we, we, these folks are replacing a function that is being lost at the local level. Let's, let's be very, very clear about this, right? Um, the investigative units at local newspapers and local broadcast were, were already being cut well before the internet really negatively impacted the traditional media businesses, but that has just completely uh, accelerated. So a lot of these local centers are trying to bring a lot of relevance back to a specific audience. Um, so the lens is a good one. Uh, Voice of San Diego is another good one. Uh, these folks, by the way, one of the early ones, very well funded, um, and are considered to be an archetype for, for local investigative journalism. And uh, I, I highly recommend you check out their, their site. So there's all these sort of different complexions of investigative uh, journalism and units out there. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting state of effect, uh, affairs. So one of the things that I'm also working on, which I think is interesting, uh, is how do you take content that is being produced for a specific audience and, and repackage it or aggregate it in ways to make it meaningful for a wider audience, right? Now, this goes towards syndication. This goes towards, um, frankly, uh, outside the United States, uh, there are a lot of audiences that are fascinated by what's happening within the United States and see U.S. as, as a, as a uh, you know, bellwether or however you want to put it. So, one of the things that we're also working on which is, is creating a taxonomy and using semantic tools to which to extract topics and, and entities so that content can be re-aggregated into uh, areas of, of interest. So in plain English, uh, the idea here is that the lens, being in New Orleans, is probably writing a lot of stories about the ecology, just de facto because of what's happening in the, in the neighborhood. Voice of San Diego, they're sitting on the, on the border with Tijuana, there's a lot of pollution. They might be writing a few less. Other folks like Mint Post in Minnesota, they have their number. But, so each one are writing stories that may have an ecological bent uh, for their local audiences. We are focusing on ways to actually extract those stories in real time and repurpose them together using semantic tools uh, to create areas of interest that, that readers beyond the local in, uh, level might find interesting. And the reason why that's important to us, frankly, is as we go back towards looking at syndication models, um, there's commercial viability in this content. So um, that, that's, a, that's something that, that we're focused on as well. Which leads me to, um, I think, probably my last point before I want to open up to some more questions. Or well, some questions, because I haven't been in yet. Um, if you look at the nonprofit model, and you look at the for-profit model, you know, there's some interesting questions there, right? So, um, Nonprofits serve the public interest, they are effectively charities, they have an educational aspect to it for the public. But what's happening is with, a, with, with more and more folks getting into the nonprofit uh, scenario, the money in foundations is not necessarily growing, A, and B, the foundations themselves are who have been, in, have been investing in innovation as, a, as an alternative. Uh, are really not necessarily equipped for sustainable um, revenue. In other words, there's X amount of money, more and more people are trying to get in, and there's less money to go around, here at the end. So um, then, of course, we have to look at commercial uh, ways of subsidizing that content. And I say subsidizing because these folks also need to keep their nonprofit status. So the question then becomes, how do, does nonprofit journalism um, coexist, or what is the competitive nature of that content in a for-profit ecosystem? And this is something that we're very much tackling right now. My personal belief is that in many respects, nonprofits have the potential for having a competitive advantage, right? So if you're a for-profit paper and you are running at a loss, you either 
frankly, uh, cut, or you print more stock and you take it out there and you try and get more investors, and you're diluting your ownership share. And I'm sure those of you who've been following what's happening at Tribune and Sam Zell and, and what's happened around that can see what a mess that can look like. On the nonprofit side of things, the way we look at things is we see that content remaining dependent on foundations for the near future, but we're hoping to bring in more sustainable revenue streams, and it's a lot of different revenue streams, by the way, it's not just syndication, and there we go, um, where why we can actually help migrate and actually create a, a, a more balanced approach to things. And frankly, not having to show a profit and bring shareholder value back also uh, has, has its benefits. The last point I want to make is the sort of the elephant in the room, which is, we talk, I talked a little bit about this, but do consumers care? And to what extent will consumers actually pay for this content? I think this is the ultimate question for us. And when you're talking about uh, projects that take a month to produce, 2,000 words, sidebars, graphics, maps, uh, interactive elements, these are very costly projects. Uh, you know, the question is, you know, ultimately, will consumers care enough about this content to actually create direct revenue streams so that we can actually move away from foundation support? And that is still very, very much uh, an, an, an unanswered question. So uh, I've touched upon lots of different points, hoping to evoke some questions from the audience. So, um, sir. Yeah, I want to get back to your discussion about metrics for nonprofits. Yes. You said your main metric was how do you measure impact. So yes. this is a really loaded question, but how do you measure impact? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> it, literally on, on the sort of practical terms, people are counting comments. Uh, they're looking at number of retweets. Uh, but this is all extremely time consuming and frankly ineffectual. I mean, ultimately, if you can get a, I don't know, to, on the other extreme, if you can get a president to resign in the United States, that's good impact, that's pretty measurable. <laughs> but, but frankly, most of these stories, you know, the unusual road to the San Diego school board, you know, they're going to be measuring impact and whether they can actually get rules or focus on getting public interest and perhaps looking at that and, and changing the rules. But this is a question that we still haven't answered. And, and again, one thing I didn't mention is I joined on June 21st, so I'm in two and a half months here. So hopefully I have another chance to come back in a little period of time and give you a better answer than that. Sir. Well, since you're still looking at foundation funding for the self-immediate future, whether you're using metrics or not, they are going to ask you what is the result of what you did besides put up so many pages, so many stories, so many pictures, graphics. So how do you report your product to them in a way that shows that you're, you're having an effect? Yeah, I mean, again, I think, I think that's, that's a related question. And I think what we tend to do is um, we show where the money goes and, and we look at the people that are being hired and the work that they're doing. I think high profile collaboration projects that get noticed and get the widest audience possible are good. So we look at audience metrics. Uh, we, we actually look at anecdotal, uh, you know, um, after, after the story is published, uh, you know, what effect did this story have? But at this point in time, it, it's sort of a mishmash of anecdotal evidence that says, you know, and, and then everybody does the same thing, which is points to the corner and says, look what's happening to the news business. If you don't support us, you know, you know, we're all in trouble. So there's a little bit of, you know, here's all the good stuff we're doing, and, and let's not let this go out, of, you know, get out of business. But as far as I'm concerned, this is this is an area that we need to tighten up and and and, and get a little bit uh, more savvy with. But interestingly, the foundations seem to have a three-year level of patience. I say three years. That's what they tell me, right? Which is, we want to see, you know, we're, they're willing to fund what we're doing at INN. They're willing to fund. Uh, the vast majority of our members, but they, they really want to see a path towards sustainability, so they want to see, in their mind, uh, more revenue streams that have the promise of actually becoming significant. Uh, they want to see mainstream media refer to the content and pick it up, and they want to see resonance of that content on the sociograph. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir. Speaking of the sociograph, is anybody doing any research that actually looks at measures, changes in degree or level of, let's say, public engagement, awareness among the public of these you know, of issues, changing points of view about issues as a result of this kind of work. 
You know, um, you can probably speak to this a little, maybe a little better than I can. I, I do know that folks like the Knight Foundation have, have commissioned uh, reports and studies on that very subject. Uh, shouldn't McCormick, be that hard to do. McCormick. It shouldn't be. It, you know, it tends to be sort of kind of time uh, consuming stuff. So I think the foundations are very keen on this question. And, uh, you know, again, given that we're still fledgling, frankly, um, I don't think they're asking that question of us just of yet, but I'm, I'm fully anticipating those questions. So, uh, I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on that third kind of requirement you have for being a member of INN in this kind of uh, the nonpartisan journalism, the transparency and funding. You know, what's kind of the rationale? Maybe explain a little bit more about why you see that as a major requirement, especially in the light of, say, something like WikiLeaks, which, you know, obviously has some value in keeping their their sources confidential so as to not create a, a source, uh, you know, other people to be targeted. So so maybe can you just kind of explain why that rationale is so, so important? Yeah, and, you know, I'm, again, under the understanding that I'm, I'm not even going to preface it. So I think the answer to that question really boils down to the fact that there's a tremendous lack of trust from the American public in, in, in journalism today. I think I read a report this morning, Center for Media Research, 25% uh, I think is the uh, trust factor, down from I think 42% 10 years ago for newspapers. So, so that literally means one in four Americans believe what they read in the newspaper. And interestingly, th interestingly uh, I think it's 36% for cable news, which does <laughs> not even go there. But, but let's be very clear, you know, the, the politicization, the balkanization, as I hear referred to more and more, of the American uh, uh, news landscape is creating this sort of, um, you know, with more and more content becoming more and more uh, skewed, um, how are we going to keep people accountable to the point where they actually trust the findings of the reports and actually act upon it? So I think that the people who founded uh, INN and, and uh, frankly, our members believe that without keeping things as much as possible in the straight and narrow, uh, we're, we're going to, frankly, we're going to lose credibility and it's going to be very hard for us to create the sustainable models. Now that said, investigative journalism is inherently anti-establishment, um, and it tends to therefore be skewed. I mean, I wouldn't be the first to say out loud that people believe NPR to be a, li a liberal uh, arm uh, of, of the media, and, and that's really hurt them uh, in, in many respects over the past sort of 10 years. So um, I think it's an ideal. I, I, I can tell you that it's inevitable that some stories that, that our folks are going to write are going to either be more partisan than we want it to be, or, or characterized as such. And uh, it, it's an issue that we're going to, we, you know, I think it's as much about a positioning and marketing and need to try and keep people accountable and have credibility with, it, with, with the audience as much as anything. Well, I'm just curious in that, in that same vein, if you're looking at the situation where um, the credibility is this idea of we're, looking, we're accountable to our financial, financial model or whatever that idea is, the transparency that way, but how are you bringing the community in um, to the stories that, that give them a sense of involvement, give them a sense that these stories are accurate, that they're participating in the stories in the way that we've seen that big you know, shift in general on the internet? I mean, when you talk about costs and stuff, why aren't you bringing the, offering the community opportunities to make their own maps and, and help with that, you know, will both be a costly thing and, you know? Yeah, well, I think that's a phenomenal question. And I think that, you know, to be, to be clear, INN does not set the editorial agenda for any of its members, right? We, I get that, but could, could you offer some Yeah, so for example, um, there, are there are different business models actually within the membership. Uh, one is, I don't know if anybody's heard of, of Spot Us. Yeah, we have a, we're, we're, there's an LA Spot Us that we are partners. Yeah. Great. So, so here we have, you know, community funding of stories. Um, Voice of San Diego have beat reporters on the neighborhood level. So there actually are lots of, of initiatives uh, underway from a lot of the members to, to provide not only community content, but actually get community feedback. Now, so that, that, that's, that's the good news. The, the tough thing to think about is um, where does citizen journalism play a part? Should comments be edited? Or should, they, you know, should comments be open? I mean, believe it or not, there is tremendous discussion about that. For, um, you know, from my background, having uh, run large for-profit sites, I know that the vast majority of sites, including Huffington Post, will pander to Drudge and to folks like Breitbart. But then when the comments come, then there's a question of how do you, you know, is that actually your community or not? But, but I, I think these, these, are, these are, are, are good questions. And, and frankly, 
um, as we try and focus on moving away from one-way journalism to true two-way journalism that's reflective of a community, I, I, I think that we, that we need to address that question more. I don't think I answered your question exactly, but uh, there are definitely things under which we We definitely think about it. And, and, it's, and, and again, for people who see investigative journalism as project-based, deep dive, you know, going through databases and come up with stories, that tends to be, you know, a team or, or, or an individual coming up with an aha moment, right? And, 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 and shining a bright light onto it. I don't think, I think there needs to be more innovation around the model. I think our definition of investigative journalism needs to be expansive. Uh, for example, I think that documentaries are, are increasingly becoming uh, an expression of investigative journalism and yet aren't really embraced right now in our membership, and that's an error for, for us. So I, I, it's something we're thinking about, but I don't necessarily have a good answer for you at this time. But people are doing a lot of things, just following up on Nani's question, too. Be sure that the team that wants to shine a bright light all of a sudden realizes how many people in the community can help shine the light by, right. you know, documenting housing code violations or whatever. I mean, things like that are happening even with legacy media. So I assume your, your, some of your partners are looking at. Yeah, that. absolutely. You know, and, and you know, the interesting thing is, like, for example, um, using tools like Hootsuite and Social Oomph and actually be able to take widgets out of, of resonance from. Twitter uh, and uh, of retweets, et cetera, et cetera, and embedding that into stories. One of the things that I hope to be doing shortly is actually training uh, and getting in people who specialize in social activation of content to actually train our members on how to include more content. Frankly, because if you're doing one project a month, there's not a reason to go back to that website unless there's a community conversation going on around that subject matter, right? So in, in the for-profit side, we talk about owning stories. And if, if you have a break, you own that story and you try and become, you get, you get out there around that story. And I, I, we'd like to some, use some of those same techniques to actually make sure that our members are also involving more community and actually being more responsive to the community on that response. Sir. A related question. Um, you said one of your focus is, is sustainability. Is there any member you have who has a particularly innovative approach to sustainability beyond just foundation grants? Well, I, 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 you know, I think Spot Us obviously is an interesting model, but no, there's no, right now I still think that, you know, if I look at Voice of San Diego as, as an example, they're, they're probably in the most, uh, they're in the strongest position financially. They've diversified, they, they still take foundation money, but they also are uh, producing content for local TV stations for which they get fees for. They do have syndication deals. Um, the Center for Investigative Reporting also will take content and create different versions of that content to put into papers, and they charge for that content too. But as far as the ratio of foundation money and donor money to actual sort of you know, market-driven revenue streams, it's still very, very much cited on the, on the foundation side. And in terms of individual donations of $5, $10, et cetera, for example, the, the Voice of San Diego site is very prominent donating yeah. that. Is that reaching any kind of approach? You know, no, I, you know, there, there is a, there is a, a, a move underfoot for a couple of members to, to actually start to create essentially digital newspaper type products that will be sent, will, will, will charge users Basically, think of it as a product that will go onto an iPad or so a subscription, or digital, so subscription based right product. But, but these are still very early days, and, and uh, you know the numbers are quite small. The numbers are quite small. I mean, for example, uh, when I was at Variety, uh, you know, the subscribing the subscription file for that product was about just around thirty thousand, right, at three hundred dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole business around that, but that clearly wasn't even enough to cover the, the news operations, and that was for a hundred year old. Uh, you know, commercial products. So, so on the for-profit side of things, they're still, you know, they're still tackling the same issues. And I think on our side, it's the same issue. And is there is there any sort of limit that uh, I mean, if, if any of these organizations move too far in sort of a classic commercial-driven approach toward raising money, does that uh, I mean, selling subscriptions add revenue? Yeah, you know, what's interesting. You know, what's interesting to me, and I'm certainly not a uh, an expert in nonprofits and. and that's, you know, that kind of uh, accounting and law. But um, I look at National Geographic as a phenomenal example of how a nonprofit can be a billion dollar business and still hold its nonprofit status. So, so there really shouldn't be any limitation to the amount of commercial revenue uh, a nonprofit can take, as so long as they abide by the, 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 the rules of, of uh, being a 501c3 core. So, which I think is encouraging, right? Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Great. At, at the same time, well, you know, one could argue at least that 
this isn't ever going to be really, I mean, every, it, because of the nature of investigative reporting, it's never going to make a profit uh, in the long term, and that you're going to need foundation money. And you mentioned that, you know, funders often say three years, and then, but, but at the same time, there's been some research that suggests that at least some uh, philanthropists realize that this is a permanent shift. That we will need this kind of thing in order to, to uh, you know, as, as Nima mentioned, the, the 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 sort of breaking up of the economic model of legacy media. So, do you have a sense of whether some of the foundation people realize that this has got to be more than a three-year deal? That this has got to be sustaining? Um, I think the answer to your question is yes. I think that every, that they realize it and they're, and they're nervous. I think that there is definitely a, a, a move afoot, particularly without, I couldn't have this conversation without mentioning ProPublica. ProPublica is not a member of INN, but you know that they, uh, they've received a uh, 10 million a year, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, gift uh, from the Sandler family. But that, that, has a, that has strings attached, as they all do, and it's finite, right? So it's, right. Not, it's not an endowment for ad infinitum. So I think the answer is yes, but. But I don't know anybody yet who I've heard that has a, a, a sort of concrete, but here's the nexus and we're going to be, you know, the, the, when I was in the for-profit side, we'd be sitting in front of VCs and show them, here's the hockey stick, right? And this is the point we become profitable, and this is when it becomes a billion dollar company. Um, I, I still think that, that uh, honestly, it's still very much up in the air. And, and I'm already working on long-term initiatives with uh, for-profit uh, commercial partners that I'm hoping to make sure that our content plays in the, in the commercial field to help understand what the monetary value could be to us. Um, so so um, I'm, I'm looking at this period of time as being a time of, of innovation, a time of, of, of foundation support. But I think what ultimately we're going to get to is probably there'll be a percentage that's foundation, there'll be a percentage that is local civic philanthropy, and there has to be a percentage that is going to be consumer supported either directly uh, or indirectly through other media partners. And we'll print up in the content next. Is there any evidence that when you, ProPublica, whoever uh, partners with a uh, for-profit operation, uh, that they cut back on their own commitment uh, money-wise and in, use you to replace something they already have? Um, I would say that there's already some examples where people have laid off investigative units. They've gone ahead and formed nonprofits. And then basically become outsourced back to the to the, to the people that lay them off on a short-term basis. So, um, but clearly the, the the shrinking of the investigative units and and the move to to dump them because only X amount of people can win Pulitzers, etc., etc., and it, it's a prestige game. That that move was a foot before the non. I think the non. In other words, I think the non-profit movement is a is a reaction to the shrinking of it, not the other way around. Did, did that answer your question? Yes. Why isn't ProPublica? Um, at this point, we, we just we're talking to them. Uh, we're talking to others. There's, we're still in that sort of recruitment phase. Uh, Texas Tribune is another really, really great nonprofit news organization that we're talking to. Um, you know, ProPublica obviously went out very publicly with with large salaries, and they've done great work. Um, and I think they see themselves as being sort of the uh, the archetype, and they want to be out there forefront themselves. And I think that there's still a question of what's the INN brand versus the individual brand. So um, my my goal is to to sign up everyone, frankly. And and and, uh, and and you know the other thing you should know about the way we're structuring the organization is we don't mandate things to the, the members other than the criteria for membership. So as we bring programs to the membership, they have the ability to opt into them. So we are a sort of an elective, and. Uh, there really is no reason for them not to join. I think it's, just to add a little bit uh, to that, when the Center for Public Integrity was encouraged by the Knight Foundation to, to bring together other um, nonprofits, and the Center for Investigative Reporting joined in very quickly and readily, and you know there was a core group that invited everyone to ProPontico, and the and ProPublica declined to come to, to ProPontico. So I think from the start, they really had, and you know, Paul, Steiger, who was here, you all, you all heard Paul. He, I think it really is about, you know, they got a lot of publicity that got, and probably for them they're thinking, you know, what do we have to gain by joining this coalition? Who knows? Right. I hope they do. And INN is still, you know, 
with, with my hire and now with Cater's hire, you know, we just frankly leave the station, right? So, you know, it took them a year to, to, to find me, get me on board, and, 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 and get things in place. So I think that, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful that over the next year, two years, that INN is going to be able to show, to realize the potential that everybody who had pecan to go thought it should. And, and uh, that's, that's my responsibility. So we'll see. Let's see what happens. Yes? Um, I was hoping you could give me a sense of scope of like the money that's coming through INN, how much you guys are getting, and how you divvy it up, and how that process works. So just to make sure I'm clear, on INN, the, uh, the Organization versus the members. We'll both either talk about okay. it. Yes. So, so um, our budget, our operating budget for this year is going to be just shy of five hundred thousand dollars for INN, um, and uh, so that involves us hiring myself and a couple of other folks. And really, the the support is coming from Knight, McCormick, Open Society, Serdna, William Penn. Um, and Buzz Woolley, who's an individual who actually helped fund and start the Works of San Diego. So, so that's what's happening on our front. The, interestingly, and this, you actually touched upon something which is really going to be an interesting question for us. As you can imagine, with 40 individual organizations, some are better funded than others. Obviously, NPR is a whole different beast. Voices San Diego we talked about. But we also have a lot of startups that are just getting going. And they're trying to find, you know, these are people who are working full time and haven't drawn a penny for a salary for themselves uh, for, for a while. And, and uh, you know, the question is, does INN find ways to prop them up and do fundraising for them, or do we let market dynamics mean that some of these folks are going to fail? And, uh, you know, it, it really is. I, I get a lot of, of calls every day from folks saying, hey, you know, what can you do about getting Knight Foundation to give me $100,000? Um, so it's, it's an interesting question. And, and as I mentioned, the foundations are themselves feel like they've opened a little bit of a Pandora's box. It's a fantastic opportunity. They all realize that, but they also need, they're also looking for ways to figure out what's the best place to put their money. So is that you have a follow-up? I have a follow-up question sure. that, sorry. Um, so obviously these foundations don't have infinite money and they can't fund every investigative project. So if this is like the direction that we're heading in, is there like only a certain number of investigative publications that we can have, because there's only so much money to go around. I would say the answer is yes at some point, mm -hmm. but I would also say that um, everybody keeps hitting the same few folks, right? And I believe that, particularly on the local level, if you're looking at local and hyper-local news, and you're looking at civic pride, and you're looking at civic money, I think most of, you know, it's going to be difficult to do. This is not easy stuff, but I believe that the members have to do a better job of activating their local communities. I mean, ultimately, if I'm writing content that's going to keep people accountable in my local community, that means that people in the local community at some point should appreciate it. And I think that they need to become more community-centric in their fundraising and their content, which goes to the latest question in the back earlier. Um, you know, just as a, a follow, I mean, one of the one of the things you I, I'm getting from what you're saying is that you you are generating your own editorial content, per se, uh, apart from the members, right? At this time, correct. Right. But then you also talk about sort of aggregating, you know, whether there's similar issues and so on, and maybe pulling them together, and then would you imagine having some sort of editorial staff to then redistribute a absolutely. these as pieces to op-ed pages or wherever it might be? Absolutely. So, so that's going to fall into two buckets, and Kate is going to be involved in, in one of these for sure as well. Um, Kate is a new communications director. So one is what I call content activation, right? Um, we know there's a project coming up. We had a great story recently about how, uh, from, from uh, Rocky Mountain News, which is another great uh, center of ours, about how um, in Colorado they, have, they also have medical marijuana, but there was no provision for, dis for destroying excess marijuana. So they're selling it legally out the front door, and then they're selling it illegally out the back door. Great stuff. To the tune of three tons a year. I mean, this is, this is not a small... And that, so, so, so here's a great story. Now that story did okay, right? It was picked up by the Denver Post, but what we need to be, and other folks, right? But what we should be doing is taking that story, know that's in the, in the, in the edit, uh, in, the, uh, in the news budget, and then think about, okay, now who, who are the partners that we should go pitch this to? What kind of deal can we do with them to get this on their front page? Coordinate that and actually, so that, that's one thing that we're doing, okay? There's also gonna be actual, uh, uh, we're hiring a collaborations editor that will also be actually looking on a project basis about how we can actually create stories through multiple members. So there's a local aspect and then there's a sort of a, a global aspect to it and actually getting the content out that way. 
The other aspect we're going to be doing is we're going to be blogging on and reporting about our members. So we can, we're going to become essentially a, almost a, a trade publication for nonprofit news so that people who want to know what's going on can see what, what's going on in that, in that level. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of questions. One I want to know, how many of you noticed on the Voice of San Diego, the we are hiring. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody was a, everybody <laughs> When I was at uh, the AJMC, the American Educators in Journalism and Mass Comm, several of us were there. It's a convention of you know, educators in journalism. And there were at least three panels that, that I was on, and who knows how many more, that were on the question of journalism schools doing journalism. Which of course, I mean, they've always done journalism, but in, increasingly our journalism is seen by more and more people, as many of you know. And we have at least 13 different organizations doing journalism here. I notice, I know Chuck Lewis's AU reporting workshop and the BU's New England Center for Investigative Reporting, but that's an interesting question. Is that some uh, an arena in which more and more of your members are likely to be coming from? I mean, you, I, you were asking about investigative reporting, and I was going to nominate Neon Times swine flu investigation last year, for right. example, and other things. So what, I wonder if that's a, Yeah, absolutely. We, we actually have, I think, of the 40 plus members, I would say actually eight are associated with the university. Some of them are just basically housed, and they're leveraging the student body, and you know, they have some kind of uh, overhead deal. Um, but, but, but absolutely, and, and I think that, um, you know, what's interesting about that, of course, is that so much is focused on sustainability, but we're also not really talking a lot about how we actually create um, jobs and uh, internship programs and, and actually finding ways, and, and INN needs to do that, right? We, we will need to, um, there, there's a, a part of the new website that's gonna be launching probably in November is gonna have essentially um, a community board where people can actually say, hey, listen, I'm looking for this, and who do you know? But, but right now, it's very ad hoc, and it, it's sort of really sort of, you know, catch as catch can. Um, so, uh, but I do believe that leveraging the, the, the J schools um, it is something that we need to think about more as well. And, it, and, and, and so, for example, there's another aspect to it, which is we're putting together right now a regional map of all our members, and it turns out that we're very consolidated in a few areas, and there's massive areas in the country that aren't being covered by our membership. And by the way, we only have one member in Los Angeles area, which is fair warning, and they only cover ecology and healthcare. So uh, here we are sitting in a phenomenally large marketplace with really one paper, I mean, Daily News, I suppose, as in part of my street, you know, so one in a bit with Long Beach as well. But th there are massive holes in the geography where there are, I think people can be coming out of journalism schools and actually looking to us to get a, essentially like a starter kit. You know, who are the foundations we should be speaking to? What's the template for, for WordPress that we, we might want to start with? What are the areas and actually have INN incubate and actually get going with, with additional uh, nonprofits? My vision is if we are truly going to be a network, we need to actually have a, an effective matrix geographically as well as vertically, right? So um, the other notion of creating centers that focus on areas of, of interest, uh, I think is something that, that we need to do. And then, and then also there's uh, obviously uh, expansion outside of the United States. Uh, sorry, one more thing I want to add real quick. We currently also have uh, two centers that are creating uh, investigative reports in Spanish. And that's, we don't read anything else in any other language besides English, but you know, these are other areas of expansion into, to, because let's face it, you know, there is a, tremendous lack of investigative uh, journalism in, in, I guess, I hate the word ethnic, but ethnic communities as well, uh, which, which is highly underrepresented uh, in, in mainstream media. Jerry, you get the last question. The, last, the very last one, hopefully it reaches that standard. Um, you're, you're facing a really interesting, obviously, public relations and marketing challenge. On the one hand, it's like there's an assumption that if we put really good investigative journalism out there, they will come. Right. The market will come. But, flip side of that coin is somebody has got to be marketing and communicating to people who may not care right now and don't pay attention. That's right. The importance of investigative journalism. Is that part of your role? And if not, whose is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, think it, I think it has to be. I mean, Nervously. Yeah, cater, cater is, that's, that's a big part of Cater's mandate. Um, you know, INN 
is, you know, as I said, kind of, kind of new. I do see it as part of our, our mandate, and there are some concepts that, we, that I'm looking at, including working out ways to create essentially uh, an archive for the best in investigative journalism, and actually getting public funding for some of that stuff too, kind of like what AFI did for, for movies. Um, there are obviously other organizations involved, like IRE, investigative reporters and editors, but the, the fact is, uh, I think it has to be us. I think we have to lead the way, but I think we have to work with, frankly, mainstream media that leverages our content. I mean, Huffington Post has the investigative fund uh, for sure, but there are a lot of large media outlets that are, are frankly, loving. You know, if you look at what's happening with AOL and Patch and, and Yahoo and, and this sort of local content that they want from basically near free, at what point are they going to actually support and actually get that content? that help us with that PR effort. So the way I look at it is I think we'll take on the burden of trying to move that thing forward, but there will end up being a media consortium, I believe, that's going to end up really trying to focus on, on, on bringing public attention to it. And, and we're going to have to activate some public figures uh, to, to help us with that cause, because you know, it, it wouldn't hurt to get a George Clooney to, to stand up and make a pitch occasion. Like if anybody awesome. knows George, you know, please, please. Well, uh, I wanted to mention to those of you uh, who are new, who are especially interested in nonprofit reporting, that our Center on Communication Leadership and Policy did a report last year on uh, nonprofit uh, reporting with David Westfall and Jeff Callan, and they also had a, a gathering here of especially Western half of the U.S. Uh, nonprofits, Seattle West and West Seattle Blog and Investigate West and others who came. And that's online too. And several of the people you've mentioned, like Scott Lewis at Voice of San Diego, have come here for, for forums. And so you can check those out on YouTube. And please join me in thanking Kevin. Thank you.